Good evening. Welcome to this webinar on why do people leave? My name is Megha Patia from Informa. Um, I have here Paul Walsh with me who will be delivering this webinar. Uh, before we start, I'd like to take you through a few administrative details, through, through a few housekeeping rules, and a little bit about the HR Observer, which has supported our webinar today. This, the HR Observer is a blog. It's an initiative by the HR Middle, by the IIR Middle East, I'm sorry, and is aimed at um, being a platform for HR professionals in the Middle East, so you can exchange insights and expertise, articles, discussions, etc., to take the industry forward. Uh, we do have a blog. We have a LinkedIn group, Twitter feeds online webinars like these, and a series of offline informal networking functions that you ha can have access to. Moving on, with regards to this webinar, um, if you have any unanswered questions at the end of it, we will post the answers to our blog so you can visit the HR Observer. The slides of this webinar, along with the recording, will be available to you, and a link will be sent to you via email in about a week after this webinar today. There will be a post-webinar survey that will pop up on your screen at the end. Please do take the time to complete it for us. Before we move on, um, Paul would like to now um, introduce himself. So I'm passing this over to Paul. Enjoy the webinar. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Mega. My name is Paul, Paul Walsh, and uh, you'll have a slide. There it is. Thank you, Megan. I have a slide there uh, which gives you all my background, my details, my CV, and my biography. I'd just like to point out that that picture you've seen of me isn't very good. I look a lot better in real life than that. Basically, I've had a lot of experience, both in the GCC and in uh, Asia and in Europe. And whilst doing many, many HR stuff, I've also got particularly interested over the last few years on this turnover problem, this problem of why people actually leave because the whole point of this seminar is to try to explain to you that I don't think it's because of the reasons you think it is. So in short what we'll look at is the real reasons that people decide to leave and uh, I've set up there on the slide spoiler alert it isn't the money and the more and more research I do on this and indeed other people do on it we're coming to the same conclusion that we, especially in the GCC, believe that people leave for a better offer. Uh, they don't. They're leaving for other reasons. And I hope to persuade you during this webinar that it's not the uh, money that's causing them to leave. Something else is causing them to leave. But the output, the outcome of why they leave, it ends up that they leave for more money. Now, I know that sounds contradictory, but I hope to take you through both the inputs and the outputs of when somebody makes this huge decision of leaving your organization. Our job in HR, our mission, if you like, is to attract, develop, engage, motivate, and retain our employees. And quite frankly, it's impossible to do any of these without knowing why people are really leaving. How can we recruit the right person if we don't know why the person he's replacing actually left? How can we make sure we're giving the right engagement and motivation to people? And of course, how eventually can we retain them? So, let's get straight into it. This is a research done by Bamboo HR. Some of you may have uh, heard of them. If you haven't, I actually recommend that you have a look at their website. Uh, they come out with some good, interesting stuff. This is a survey they did in 2014. And the four top reasons there why people leave were given as these. You can see them on the screen. Advancement, career. I don't think there's any surprise there. Uh, development opportunities are a big reason for people leaving. That's widely known. Work-life balance. Now, this survey was a worldwide uh, survey, so included uh, Australia, Europe, uh, USA, as well as the wider uh, Middle East and Africa. But work-life balance is certainly becoming a bit of a more of a hot topic in this part of the world as well. Number three, I think, covers all kinds of sins that we're going to talk about. The relationship with the boss. 
and you'll see down the bottom of this short list that money was a reason why people leave. So according to Bamboo, we've actually got three reasons above money why people actually leave. A bit closer to home in the GCC, they had a look at the top triggers. Now, these aren't mainly the reasons why people leave, but they're the triggers. They're the things that people start thinking about when they start picking up the newspaper or going on to Gulf Talent or Bait to start looking for jobs. Trust issues with the boss, whether it's over things like performance appraisals, the boss watching what they do all the time, the boss actually standing over to making sure they're doing the correct attendance, whatever it might be, various trust issues with the boss acted as a trigger. It got people started thinking, I've had enough of this place, I want to get out. Number two lines up with the bamboo uh, research there about work-life balance that more and more, of course, we're now in 2015, people are expecting us to work out of office hours, which is fine now and again, but when it becomes the norm, people are starting to think, can I find something else? Number three was a surprise, difficult co-workers. Well, it's a surprise to me, um, because usually with co-workers, we can deal with any uh, nastiness, any backstabbing, but it came up there as number three as a trigger. Didn't like the people I was working with, so I started to look for other jobs. Being blamed for the boss's mistakes? Well, you're going to find in this seminar that the boss comes up an awful lot. And number five, similar to number two there, inflexible working hours. So if I wanted to come in a bit late in the morning, I wouldn't be allowed to. And uh, things like that are top triggers for people when it comes to why they actually leave. In the GCC here, the top three reasons from the research were cited as this. Number one, lack of development, which uh, is in line with the rest of the world. And there's the money issue there at number two. So many of you might now be thinking, oh, well, okay, Paul, money is there, but it's actually in the GCC, it's number two. But these are the reasons that people are giving. I wouldn't say they're the reasons people are actually leaving. You'll see number three, which doesn't appear anywhere outside of the GCC, is that people are leaving for personal reasons. In other words, they won't even tell us why they're leaving. Now, we could have a whole uh, webinar, in fact, we could have a whole workshop on why people are afraid to tell HR why they're leaving. But what I'm going to do for the purpose of this short webinar is to put personal reasons along with the boss and see where we get to on that. Most of you should have actually seen this, I hope. This was another survey done by Gallup, the US polling company. And they do, as you know, an annual engagement survey which takes in over 150,000 people in 170 countries. And you can't argue with those kind of numbers. And what they discovered was that 70% of people actually hate going to work. They hate getting up in the morning, hate dragging themselves into work, hate it while they're there. Now, hate is a very, very strong word. So we looked into why that kind of thing actually happened. Now, can you actually hate an organization? If you think of the organization you're working in, can you turn around and say, I hate this company? Well, I suppose you can, but when it's analysed a little bit more deeply, you don't hate the company, you hate what a person or somebody within that organisation has actually done to you. It's not the company itself. The company or the organisation is made up of people. Do we hate the building we're working in? Again, sometimes. I, my friend, a close friend of mine, is uh, an architect, and he says that some buildings, the way they're designed, can be hateful. But I don't think that's the reason why people hate going to work. It's people. People are hateful. Now, as I said in the kind of introduction, who are we talking about when we're talking about hateful people at work? Our colleagues. Can our colleagues be hateful? Well, yes, they can. But we learn as children in the school ground how to, how to take care of things like that. There's two strategies. We can confront or we can ignore. We can deal with our colleagues, usually, unless the situation is very, very bad indeed. 
Now, what about those of us who are in a position of management or leadership and have subordinates? Can our subordinates be hateful? Again, yes, they can. But hang on a second. We're the managers. We can deal with that. We can control that. And by the way, if any of you are thinking that as a manager, I don't like it when people hate me, well, here's a little lesson for you. You didn't become a manager to be liked. Are bosses hateful? I'm afraid the answer here is yes. And the reason, again, is fairly straightforward. Bosses not only share the kind of bad behavior that colleagues and indeed subordinates may give you, but they also have power. And this perceived power, sometimes we give our managers credit for too much power. The bad behavior plus perceived power comes to hatefulness. If they can bully you, if they can persuade you to do things that you don't want to do, if they can make you work longer hours than you're supposed to, if a colleague asked you to do that, you'd know how to deal with it. If a subordinate tried to bully you, you'd know how to deal with it. But when a boss tries to bully, abuse, or to destroy your work-life balance, then that becomes hateful. It equals hatefulness. And it starts getting us to think, about whether we're in the right organization. Uh, I don't usually show slides like this, but I think it's absolutely essential uh, that we have a look because most of us are talking about engagement. We either run engagement surveys or we're thinking of running engagement surveys. Engagement surveys are based on the very famous Q12 questions that were devised some years ago. Now, most engagement surveys, of course, have expanded on the Q12 and include 40, 60, or even 100 questions. But the basic 12 questions that you need to find out to judge whether an employee is motivated and engaged are these. And you have the first six in front of you. Now, I'd like you to look at these questions and just as I'm going through them, ask yourself the question, who's responsible for giving the employee a good attitude and a way of answering this question positively? So question number one, I know what's expected of me at work. If we get a negative answer on that, who's responsible? Is it HR? Is it the salary? Or is it the boss? Number two, I have the materials and equipment I need to do the job right. Is that HR's responsibility? It's the boss, isn't it? Number three, at work I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. Again, a negative answer to that, we're talking about this person's manager. My associates and fellow employees are committed to doing quality work. Okay. Can I blame the boss for that one? Probably. Because if your team members, your associates and fellow employees are not committed to doing quality work, why is that? The mission or purpose of my company makes me feel my job is important. I might embarrass anybody who's on this webinar, but I often begin my uh, workshops, and especially my strategic workshops, by asking the question, what is the mission of your company? I usually get a 3% response. People don't know the mission. They don't know the purpose of the company. They don't know the vision. They don't know the values of the company very often. So whose job is it to do that? Well, I think HR needs to take a little bit of responsibility here. But once again, it's the boss. And question number six of the Engagement Q12, it's actually one of my favorite questions. I have a best friend at work. You'll be surprised how many people actually do stay at work, not because of higher salaries, not because of career development, but because their social life is actually based around their workplace. Finally, so I don't usually like putting... Uh, slides like this on lists up, but uh, it, it is important. Uh, these are the final six questions of the Q12. Do I need to go through them all to make my point? At work, my opinion seemed to count. That's the boss. My supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. If you get a negative answer, it's the boss. There is someone at work who encourages my development. Negative answer, it's the boss. This last year, I've had opportunities to work, to learn, and grow. <coughs> Excuse me. Negative answer is the boss. Past seven days, I've received recognition or praise for doing good work. Negative answer, it's the boss. 
in the past six months someone at work has talked to me about my progress negative answer it's the boss sorry if that was a little repetitive but I really wanted to make my point these are the 12 core questions around engagement 70% of people who are answering engagement surveys are answering negatively they're saying that they hate work they're giving negative questions to 11 sorry negative answers to 11 of these 12 questions and 11 of these 12 questions are responsibility of their direct boss their direct manager Now, a major problem we have in HR, and I know those of you who are listening to this are probably thinking the same thing, they're saying, uh, hang on a minute, Paul, uh, it's not as bad as all that, surely. Uh, before engagement, we used to have employee satisfaction surveys. They regularly scored 70% satisfaction. And uh, here in HR, we think everything's pretty good. Well, let me show you this. It's another company, by the way, that you should be subscribing to and getting as much information as you can from them. Connexa. Uh, this is a two, nearly three-year-old uh, survey. I haven't seen one done since. Uh, perhaps you can comment and debate on whether or not you think things have changed. I don't think they have. Again, uh, very cleverly, Connexa looked at very general engagement questions down the bottom and just looked at five different areas of engagement and the clever thing they did was they separated employees answers from HR answers you can see employees there in the red line uh, HR answers on the blue and let's have a look are you engaged are you involved do you feel part of the organization 34, 35% of employees said, yes, they are. 68% of HR employees said they were. That's a huge difference. The next question was, would you recommend our organization to a friend? Employees, 38%. HR, 81%. Does our company give good, fair benefits? Our employees quite like that question, and it went up to 48%. HR came down a little on that and said 72%. Still a huge gap between what the employees are saying and what HR is saying. Then our question, do you think our compensation is good? Now you'd expect both parties to mark this down. Nobody likes their salary. And this is actually where HR came closer to the employees. Employees said 30% were happy. HR only 53, 54%. And then the final question, the actual question that was asked was, do you see yourself in this company in two years' time? Only 42% of employees said they saw themselves remaining in the company, whereas 83% of people in HR said they would. Now, if you are like me and a HR professional, this graph should give you huge cause for concern. This is not just a perception gap. This is a whole reality gap here. What seems to be happening is that our lives in HR bear no reality whatsoever to what the rest of the employees in our organization are doing. Uh, by the way, you'll be interested to know that this survey took place in the Gulf and in the wider Middle East. So it's we in HR looking at this particular survey, which I readily admit is two and a half years old. But looking at this survey here, it seems HR, we can't really see what the problem is. What is wrong with our people? And yet our employees are probably looking at us and saying, what is wrong with HR? Can't they see what's really going on in our organization? I think, and some people in HR get upset when I see this, but I think we actually in HR, we do lead a different life to the rest of our employees. And sometimes it is a different and more flexible life. Generally in HR, we can turn up a bit late if we have something to do at home. We can leave a little early. We can go out and pick up the kids if there's a problem. Uh, we can work around certain things. Many of our employees, as you know, cannot. 
They cannot be late in the morning. There is no flexibility. They cannot decide to go home a little early. They, they are there from when the organization opens until when it closes. So we have a lot more going for us in HR. But I think what we need to do is actually start looking at what our employees are going through and see if we can be more empathetic with them. I looked up retention in the uh, Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, made me laugh. The continued possession, use or control of something. Uh, so when we're trying to retain something, we're trying to actually continue to possess it or control it. And of course, this is very difficult when it comes to humans uh, because we don't own them. Very difficult to control them as well. But uh, that's what it is. Now, what we need to do is to discover quite simply why people are leaving and then how and who to keep. And the only way we can do this is by effective interviewing. Do we actually know why they're leaving? Well, we know what the survey tells us and we know what our exit interviews are saying, but is it the truth? As I said before, our role is to develop, reward, retain, motivate our employees, and we can't do any of this unless we know why they're leaving. Can we trust our exit interview data? I don't think you can. In the GCC in particular, people are not even giving us a reason why they're leaving. They just say it's personal. Now, there's a whole trust issue here between our employees and HR, of course. They don't trust us. Why don't they trust us? Perhaps they're scared that we'll give a bad reference. Perhaps they're frightened that we won't pay them their full end of service benefits. There's many reasons why they don't trust us. But if they are the reasons, then HR, we should be ashamed of ourselves that people who are leaving can't actually trust us to tell the truth. So consequently, we look at exit interview data and say, well, if they're not telling the truth, why bother with it? I think we need to take a bit more care. The other problem with our exit interviews is that we are not measuring the right things. We should be measuring the input to their reason to leave rather than the outcome. And I'll tell you a little story in a second, which I hope puts this all in place. But when person tells you that I'm leaving because I'm getting a 10% pay rise, that's the outcome. That's not the reason they're leaving. It's the outcome, perhaps, of months and months of job searches, both online and in the newspapers. Because what we really want to know is when do employees mentally check out of our organization? When do they make the decision, I've had enough, I'm going, and what caused that? One thing we should need to do some research on, actually, is how long does it take to get another job? Now, the answer, as with most things in HR, is it depends. But we should have some kind of average. For most people, it takes between five to seven months to find another job. Some people in some specialist areas can find a job quicker. Talent usually can find a job quicker than other people. But five to seven months is a long time. That's five to seven months people have been working in your organization, but really trying to leave. Uh, I think you can see that in front of you. I don't think there's anybody in HR who's ever received a letter like that. It doesn't happen. The I quit letter never happens. And let me tell you why. A person goes to work. He hopes for things, perhaps they don't happen. He hopes for a career. He hopes for development. He hopes to be treated fairly. Those things don't happen. Hey, that's life. We all get on with it. He has a boss. His boss phones him at 8 o'clock in the evening, just when he's sitting down to have dinner with his or her family. This boss sends emails at 11 o'clock at night. Basically, this boss is a nightmare. But he puts up with it because that's what work is like. But at some stage, something happens. The boss gives him an unfair performance appraisal. The boss pushes him once too far. The boss asks him to work at a weekend when he's worked the last three weekends. The boss gives him another phone call at nine o'clock at night, just when he was sitting down for a restaurant with his wife. At that stage, the employee decides, that's it. 
I quit. However, he never actually says it. He doesn't tell the boss he's quitting. He doesn't march into human resources, slap down a letter and say, I quit. Now, why does this never happen? The reason it never happens is because people aren't stupid. Nobody's going to quit their job until they've got another job to go to. I mean, perhaps you can all imagine yourself marching home to your wives or husbands and telling them that you quit on a matter of principle. I'm pretty sure your wife would give you a quick slap around the face and say, get back to work, you idiot, and make sure we have food on the table. So we don't quit. What we do is we just say, yes, sir, no, sir. And then we switch on our laptops or fire up our smartphones and we log on to Bait or Golf Talent or Monster.com and we post our CV. Nothing happens until three weeks later we get an email telling us we've got an interview. Now this becomes then an interesting part for anybody who's planning to leave the organisation. The incident that triggered him putting his CV onto bait and all the other job agencies, that's kind of been settled, it's forgotten, it's past, life's got back to normal. But now sitting in front of him on his screen is an invite to go for an interview. Now should he go? Well, the answer is most people actually do go, but they do have a problem to overcome first. And that problem is that the interview takes place during work time. So I know all of you who are listening at present will, be work, uh, will have worked this one out before me. How do you attend an interview for another job when you're supposed to be at work? You go sick, of course. Everybody will pick up the phone on the day of the interview and they'll phone up their boss and they'll give a little... <coughs> <coughs> Anna Marie, I'm sick. And we don't even question it. And HR need to look at sick patterns more regularly to see what's going on. Somebody goes sick, they attend the interview. They don't get the job, but they've learned an awful lot now. They've learned that there's jobs out there. They've learned that they can get an interview and they've learned how to conduct themselves at an interview, which they probably haven't done for two or three years. They return to work, fire up their computers, their laptops or their smartphones, and then redo their CV and do it properly this time. They make it more professional. They find out that job agencies give you the opportunity to apply for seven to ten different jobs. All you have to do is change your CV a little. People can do this because HR never checks CVs anyway. So away you go, and now you really begin your job search. You get a couple of telephone interviews, didn't go too well. You get another face-to-face -face interview, didn't go too well. All the time, three months, four months, five months is passing. You get another interview, and you get a job offer. The job offer is actually for slightly less money than you're earning now. And this becomes a big test of people. Do you quit and take a lower offer, or do you stay? Most people, according to surveys, over 90% actually stay at this point. It's only if you really, really, really hate your job that you're going to quit for less money. You persevere. An average time length between five and seven months, as I've said before, after the incident, after you've started looking for a work, you get a job offer. It's 5% more than you're getting at the moment. Of course, you'll tell everybody it's 20%, but it's actually 5% more than you're getting at the moment, and you decide to accept. You then walk into HR, and you give them the letter. Here is my resignation letter, you say, to which HR say, oh dear, why are you leaving? To which the employee says, I got a better offer. Which is true. He did get a better offer. But what we in HR fail to do is to actually take the guy back in time to find out why he actually applied for a job in the first place. Because that's the reason he's leaving. It's got nothing to do with the money, nothing to do with the better offer. Now let me make myself absolutely clear here. If you're paying people 50% under the market rate, people will leave you for the money. But most people aren't. What we try to do, of course, is we have a salary survey every year and put ourselves in the second or third quartile and make sure that we're not too far away from our competitors. 
if you are 50% or 60% below what the market rate is for people, well, be prepared for high turnover. But if you're within, I would suggest, 7 to 12% of your competitor and people are leaving you, it's not the money. They're leaving for something else. It would be so much better for HR if people quit in anger. If they'd had enough, they just actually walked out of the office and said, I quit. We could deal with it. We'd know what was going on and we'd know the true reason. But I'm afraid that scenario only happens in Hollywood. And you've probably seen it on the screen where the big star storms into the office and says, I quit. And everybody in the office claps as he walks out with his bag. Only happens in Hollywood. Doesn't happen in real life. I should perhaps say, as I do on my seminars, to be fair, it also happens in Bollywood. But in Bollywood, of course, he says, I quit, and 50 women appear and start singing, and hala walla walla, and the rain starts to fall out the ceiling. But it's still the same thing. So try to find out what's the real reason that people actually leave. Interview data needs to be regularly analyzed. You need to have an expert going through it. Uh, if you've got turnover above 7%, there's something going wrong in your organization. It needs to be regularized, uh, regularly analyzed sorry, on a monthly basis. Your interviews need to be conducted by a highly trained HR professional who's got good interviewing skills. And, uh, uh, I've spoken to a few companies who are putting their exit interviews online. If you're considering this, please stop. It's ridiculous. Somebody's leaving your company and the last thing we do for them, we won't even sit down and speak to them. We won't even shake their hands and say goodbye. We send them an online questionnaire. Really? Is that how you want employers to remember your company? Get a professional HR trained person to sit down and actually interview them. And the way I've looked at this in the past, I'm not guaranteeing you 100% success with this, but these are the questions that you should ask, and they should be asked in this order. The, those of you who are trained in uh, competency-based interviewing will perhaps recognize the technique. What I try to do is to get people to go back in time, to go back into the situation. So I never ask people why they're leaving. Not at all. I ask them where they're going. Slightly different emphasis. Now, sometimes, of course, they'll tell you the company. Sometimes they won't, but it doesn't matter. We've, we've, we've established what we're here to talk about. The next question I ask them, I, I, by the way, I always congratulate them on getting a new job. I then ask them, where did they see the job advertised? You know, did they see it in the traditional print media? Did they see it online? Was it Gulf Talent Date? What was it? down there and that gets them thinking and they say well yeah I saw it in the newspaper uh, some of them will tell you they were headhunted of course they once they start lying they just can't stop but if they do say that they were headhunted say who were they headhunted by at what level of the organization was it you'll probably find out that their cousin works there but they weren't headhunted the next question I ask is how long have you been looking now, I guarantee that they will lie to you when they answer this question, but that's not important. The actual answer isn't important. If they've been looking for nine months, they'll tell you it's been three months. Nobody will want to say they've been looking for nine months. If they say it's been one month, you can guarantee it will be four or five months, but that's not important. What I want to do is to get them thinking about the time span between when they got the job and when they started looking for the job. So whatever they tell you will be rubbish. Don't worry. It doesn't matter. But what we've put in their mind is the idea that there's been a time gap between something happening and them leaving. I let them think about that for a few seconds, and then I ask them the question. You saw this job advertised in the Gulf Talent. You've been looking for a job for three or four months. I'm interested. What made you start looking for a job? You do not get 100% guaranteed accuracy on this. But I found since I started using this technique over five, six years ago, that I'm getting a better return and a better answers for people. I'm getting more people saying things like, well, actually, it was an unfair appraisal. Uh, well, actually, 
I've just had enough of working at weekends. People start telling you what it is because you brought them back in line. You brought them back in time to act when it actually happens. So I recommend that a few of you try this. I, I, actually try looking and getting people to look at the process of what made them leave. Uh, we seem to have a repeat down there. Sorry about that. So the better offer that people keep telling you about, especially here in the GCC, remember the bamboo uh, survey said it was item number four, whereas in the GCC it was mentioned as number two. I don't think that's the real reason. I believe that the better offer is an outcome that most employees will achieve when leaving. Who's going to leave for less money? But it is not the reason they leave. The reason, the trigger that made them want to leave happened in the past, and sometimes long, long in the past. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, it is the boss. It's the boss that does this. Now, whether it's the boss not doing career development planning, whether it is the boss bullying and abusing the employees, whether it is the boss not recognizing or appreciating, we all know the reason. Perhaps most of us in HR have been in this situation before. For those of you who are in a second or third job in your career, I'd ask the question of you. What made you leave your last job? You don't have to post it on the webinar. Keep it to yourself. But I'll guarantee that many of you out there listening to this, the reason, the real trigger that made you want to leave wasn't money. It was something that somebody at your previous organization did to you that you thought was unfair. Now, we haven't got time in this webinar to go through all the solutions to this, and I don't even want to start, to be honest. What I want you to do is start taking your exit interviews a lot more seriously than many organizations do. I want you to revamp your exit interviews to include those questions that I gave you on the previous slide. And I want you to make sure that when these interviews are conducted, they are done by a professional interviewing guy. Your recruitment manager should be doing this. Somebody who can actually get stuck in to the employees to find out the real genuine reasons why they're leaving. And then HR, I want you to present your findings to directors or C officers at every opportunity you can. I want you to stop talking about percentages. I was at an executive committee meeting quite recently with an, uh, an organization. Now, this is an organization with 3,000 people. And the HR representative stood up and said that turnover at the moment is 7%. It has been 7%. Year on year, it was 7.3%. So overall, the trend is going down. Uh, our turnover is 7%. We're expecting it to, to remain around 7.2% for the rest of the year. And as I looked around the table, everybody had glassed over, as you probably have, and started going to sleep. I then said to the guy, what does this mean in actual numbers? And he looked at me as if I was crazy. And I did a quick calculation in my head. And I said, you're actually telling us that 250 people are leaving your company every year. And the entire executive board just sat up and said, that can't be true. I said, it'll do the calculation yourself. And they did. Some of them even found the calculator app on their phones. And away they went. I said, yes. I said, we've got to stop looking at turnover in terms of percentages. In this particular company, every working day, somebody was leaving. One person was leaving every day. And what I also tell people, if you've got turnover at 10%, that means in five years' time, half the people who are with you will have left. Half of them. It doesn't matter how big your organization is. So we need to take this seriously. We need to get talking about it. We need to tell people that, yeah, our environment isn't very good. Our work-life balance isn't very good. So let's stop all the nonsense. Let's present it. People are leaving your company because of work-life balance boss abuse, career development. Let's tell our top people in the organization. If they're quite happy with that situation, we can carry on. And by the way, if they are happy with that situation, I strongly recommend you get your own CV out, polish it up and get ready to leave your organization and find a better one. That's it from me, Paul Walsh. I'm on time, I think. Time for questions.
I'm just having a cup of coffee while you get your questions ready. Right. Thank you for listening in. Uh, we end the webinar here. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, do keep in touch with us. Drop us a line if there's anything in particular you'd like us to address in terms of new webinars coming up in the future. Thank you very much. And as I said in the beginning, uh, we will email you the links of the recording and the slides within a week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.